the first thing we want to do is the time to maturity there. For bonds, this statistic is quite simple, let's say. Everybody of us probably knows what the time to maturity actually is. It's the time until the principal is basically paid back. The uh, average time to maturity is then calculated by using, as you see in this formula, by using the maturity, the time to maturity of each bond, multiplying it by the actual valuation. With bond, very important, you of course take the dirty price valuation, which means that accrued interest is also accounted for. And then you divide it by the sum of all valuations, and by this you can, yeah, you basically get the arithmetic average time to maturity. As I said, for portfolios uh, with plain, uh, with only plain vanilla bonds, this is uh, quite, yeah, it's it's a good measure for interest rate sensitivity. Of course, there are other more advanced sensitivity analytics, like for example duration. But we wanna, we, we do not wanna touch this complexity today. So we will stick with that. And the only problem there, or a very big problem there, actually, is that when it comes to more complex bonds. This statistic is quite misleading, and Mark, um, I think you brought us some or an example today uh, where you can show us that the average time to maturity of more complex bonds is not really applicable as a statistic in the market. Yes, absolutely. First, you just said we are not talking about duration today. I would like to add that all problems with regards to reporting that we are talking about today equally apply to other metrics such as duration, modified duration, and so on. So, yeah, which kind of ones uh, is the average maturity in calculating the average maturity? Not really meaningful. Well, there are many, many bonds outstanding, either perpetual bonds that have no maturity at all, or hybrid securities that do have a maturity, that both have early redemption options, so-called call dates. So mm -hmm. although a perpetual bond might have, a, a perpetual bond doesn't come with a, with a clear maturity, these bonds usually can be redeemed at a certain point in time. And, and the same is true for, for, for example, for, finan for, for debt of financial institutions, which usually have yeah, the option, the, the issuer usually has the option to redeem those bonds early. Okay. And um, so, first of all, these early call dates, these early call options that, that the, the issuer has, these call options reduce interest rate sensitivity. And one has to be aware of the average maturity in the end, quite similar to, 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 to the duration, is the number that tells you something or that might tell you something is supposed to tell you something about the interest rate sensitivity of a bond, right? So mm -hmm. um, if a bond has a call option, an early call option for the issuer, that will in general lower the interest rate sensitivity of the bond. So this is something that one has to be aware of and that is quite difficult to uh, implement into the standard formula or into the standard calculations of, of a duration or of an average maturity. So what we, what we brought here is a chart with a bond, the company XYZ bond. And I would like to, to just shortly describe to you um, how such a early redemption option, such a call option through a step up works. So what's a step up? A step up is an incentive for the issuer to redeem a bond early. I'll just later elaborate a little why an issuer would redeem a bond early. So we have the, the, the bond here which was issued with a 7% coupon rate and the company XYZ issued that bond and now the market scenario A um, is in place. So the interest rates came down, this is one option, or um, equally not, not the interest rate might have come down but the issuer credit of the company XYZ might have improved. So in both cases the company is paying more today than it used to be, than it should pay in case the, the company would raise more debt today right. or new debt today, so to say. So a call option generally gives the issuer the option to redeem the bond early. Now, in scenario B, we have an unchanged um, interest rate environment. And still, in that case here, redeeming the bond early after three years and especially after five years would make a lot of sense for the company because this company XYZ bond 
has a so-called step up. So after period or between period two and three, year two and three, the coupon that the company has to pay on, on the bond increases. An increase in the coupon payment yeah, is, is, is some kind of a incentive for the company to, to, to redeem the bond early. And um, this because is something... They would, yeah, because then you would be able to issue a new bond for cheaper rates, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is the, the reason. That might be either due to lower interest rate environment or due to lower refinancing costs due, due to an improved credit of the company itself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so here in scenario C, this is actually the only scenario where calling the bond isn't sensible uh, after year three or especially after year five, after the coupon rate of the bond has increased even further. So why does a company implement such an incentive to call? So for example, for financial institutions, a early redemption option is usually integrated into those bonds in order to provide for pro possible changes in the regulatory environment for these bonds of financial institutions. So um, although those bonds might, be, uh, might have not a, a maturity date, they still have a, a, a potential point in time where they can be redeemed. Um, okay, so in order to, in to deal with possible, for example, um, regulatory changes, right? Okay, so, so to summarize when it comes to this, uh, the, the statistic, the time to maturity, um, although, just to, to, to rephrase it in my words, although the, the bonds are usually issued either with no maturity or with a very long-term maturity, um, due to that fact that this ball could be called at some point, the market treat the bond as if the maturity was at that call date. Is that true, Mark? Yeah, that is at least true for those bonds where either the interest rates have decreased below the, the level where the bond, mm -hmm. uh, where the interest rates were when the bond was issued, or the credit worthiness of the issuer has improved. Okay. There's actually one thing that I wanted to add here, and this is uh, rating agencies. So rating agencies treat certain uh, treat debt as equity if certain things apply. Okay. And so in, in in certain cases, if a bond that that has no maturity. Uh, and a rating agency might, is, might treat the bond or might treat half of the bond as equity. But still, to, to somehow get around this, this rule that the rating agencies actually come up with, many companies issuing hybrid debt actually issue a hybrid debt without a maturity, but with a strong incentive to call after 10 years. So this is something that, that is really commonplace for hybrids, for hybrid bonds of, of, of okay. corporate of, of, of corporates in order to both fulfill the requirements of the rating agencies in order to, to, to make sure that the bond is treated as equity and at the same time show the, the buyer of the bond, the investor, that the bond is going in, is in fact going to be redeemed after let's say 10 years because there's such a high incentive to call for the, for the issuer. How, how, would, how would such a high incentive look like, Mark? Um, yeah, well, such a high incentive might, might look like that, that the bond, uh, for example, carries a yield of, let's say, a coupon of 4.5% for the first 10 years, fixed, mm -hmm. and afterwards mm -hmm. the coupon formula changes to, let's say, a variable component, let's say, Euribor plus 600 basis points. So this would be yeah. a, a, a level that is so high that um, okay. either the credit worthiness of the of the corporate uh, would have to weaken substantially, or yeah. uh, the bond would become way okay. too expensive not to redeem um, at see. the first call date. I see. Okay. That that and then in those cases, of course, the maturity which is then listed in the in the uh, prospectus, which is whatever, a very long or even perpetual, um, this would of course not make any sense because you would assume or there's a high probability that this bond is redeemed, which means that the maturity should be the call date, right? Exactly, and in fact, uh, um, such mechanisms are integrated into basically every hybrid bond okay. of both financial institutions and, and corporates. Okay, okay, yeah, very interesting actually, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so we, we, we touched on, on, on what is in this slide here actually early on when I tried to describe these me mechanisms just a little. So a bond with a fixed maturity is usually priced with a yield to maturity, right? 
um, everybody is familiar with that. Bond, bonds with no maturity or a very long maturity, there, I mean there are bonds issued with a maturity in 2100 to 2100 or something, um, this is basically equal to having no maturity for, 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 for investors yeah. because the nominal amount in, in the year 2100 will basically have no, no means. So let's just talk about the bond has no maturity. So in that case, in case the interest rates have fallen and or the um, credit worthiness of the, of the issuer has improved or has mm -hmm. stayed equal, then those bonds are usually priced as with a, with a so-called yield to call. So um, in that case, a call, the, the market participants price in the call and price the, the bond as though, as if the bond is redeemed at the first call, at the first call date. And only in case a bond trades significantly below par or below the price at which the bond can be called at the first call date, only in that case the bond is priced at a at a mix or at a as a um, yield to maturity or a so-called current yield. The current yield is um, the, the the coupon over the divided by the um, by the price of the bond. So for a bond. Uh, with a four and a half percent coupon trading at ninety percent, that would have a current yield of five percent. So, and this is the way market participants actually deal with that. So, looking either at the current yield or looking at the yield to maturity or the yield to call, just depending on the likelihood of a call date, uh, a call being 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 drawn drawn by the by the issuer. Okay, cool. Very interesting. Thanks for that. I actually brought another example from, from basically our experience, how those statistics get calculated when it comes down to basically fund administration firms who usually do the reporting for their funds. And there are some, of course, they those guys have limited uh, possibilities there, but some things which, which uh, I, f I think show very precisely that individual reporting in this field is very necessary, especially when we come to more complex structures like hybrid bonds is, for example, when you go to hybrid uh, perpetual bonds, so with no maturity, basically, the, the bonds are assumed to have time to maturity zero. And this is actually calculated in the time to maturity, which means that a bond which has no maturity, a perpetual bond, actually lowers the time to maturity, the average time to maturity. So obviously this is uh, something which is indeed actually wrong. And uh, hybrid structures, for example, do not uh, usually take the call dates into account. So, Mark, as you said, usually, um, especially when you have bonds which uh, have a very high incentive to be redeemed, um, usually you should take the call date as the maturity, but in, in, in the standard reporting sphere, that's not the case. And the long-term maturity is taken into account, which on the other hand then, of course, raises the average time to maturity. So, depending on your portfolio, that basically means that yeah, the, the average time to maturity of the statistic can either be totally misled or actually, yeah, it's really wrong. And the consequence, of course, is especially when you work with not only plain vanilla bonds, you should not report this average time to maturity calculated in a standard way by your fund administrator to your, yeah. um, to your investors, right? Yeah, I mean, in the end, it all boils down to interest rate sensitivity. Interest rate sensitivity is a topic that everybody is talking about. Interest rates are at very, very low level. Interest rate sensitivity is high for long for, 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 for bonds with a high duration, with a high average time to, to yeah. maturity. Yeah. And call dates without a doubt, without a doubt, reduce interest rate sensitivity. Yeah. So and, and this is something that is not incorporated in, in most fact sheets or in most uh, calculations yeah. when it comes to yeah. calculating the average the average time to maturity or the duration of a of a portfolio. And one thing that is probably quite important here is the fact that hybrid securities, given the low interest rate environment, become more and more popular, both from the corporate side as well as from the investor side. More and more investors are looking into hybrid securities because this is a way where actually bonds can still earn money. And Corporates are actually looking into issuing hybrid securities because there's much demand for them and uh, the interest rates have, have gone down much faster than the cost of equity have, has come down. 
there's a huge spread between uh, between equity valuations and bond valuations, and this makes it actually quite attractive for for corporates to issue hybrid debt. And this makes it much more relevant than it was in the past to to look at these figures and how we actually calculate them. And this also yeah. um, it has was was of relevance to us. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's uh, already very helpful.